Welcome to the Carpenter Performing Arts Center. We'd like to remind you that the taking of photographs of any kind is prohibited during the performance. At this time, we'd like to ask that you turn off or silence all electronic devices and keep in mind the fact that texting can also be a disturbance to others. Also, please take a moment now to locate your nearest exit in case of an emergency. And now we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Carpenter Center's Executive Director, Michelle Robert. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome to the Carpenter Center to um, another one of our B Word Project events. This evening's program is part of a two-year program that we're doing at the Carpenter Center looking at censorship and the response to it. It's called Banned, Blacklisted, and Boycotted. And when you've said that about a million times, you shorten it to the B Word Project. So this is part of the B Word Project. I need to thank the Association of Performing Arts Presenters and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation that provided the funding for all of our B Word Project activities. And there are a lot of them coming up. So I wanted to let you all know that the next two weeks are going to be crammed full of activities looking at censorship here at the Carpenter Center. Tonight, we have a stunning program about art through the centuries and its censorship. Tomorrow at 1 p.m., right here, free, we have a lecture by noted international choreographer Bill T. Jones. If you don't know who Bill T. Jo Jones is, go home tonight and Google him. You will be surprised to see his huge CV. He's a MacArthur genius, he's a choreographer, he's an artist, he's a thinker, he's a philosopher, he's an amazing human being. Next month, in November, our California State University Department of Dance students will be performing one of his signature works. It's called Reading Mercy and the Artificial Nigger which is a short story by Flannery O'Connor that Mr. Jones translated into dance. So tomorrow, he'll be here to tell us about his artistic process in creating that piece and to talk about his own experiences with censorship. It will be riveting, and, and I really encourage you not to miss it. Next week, on Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. right here, we are having a panel discussion with <coughs> noted experts on the entire NEA4 issue. And I, I figure you're not really old enough to remember the NEA4. Anybody remember it? The NEA4 was a huge controversy <coughs> that happened in 1990 when four performing artists were promised artistic grants from the National Endowment for the Arts. But then two members of Congress got wind of that, Jesse Helms, and Dana Rohrabacher, you know that name. And they decided that the art these people were practicing was obscene, and they forced the National Endowment to rescind their grants. The artists did not take that standing down. They sued the government, and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, sparking what is called the culture wars. We have a noted um, expert in the field, Carl Mannheim, who is a professor at Loyola Law School and an ACLU-affiliated attorney, will be mediating a panel with our own Dr. Craig Smith, the director of the Center for First Amendment Studies on campus, and Carol Sobel, who was the attorney who represented the NEA4 at the Los Angeles district level. That, and we will have three out of the four artists participating in that panel, Karen Finley, Tim Miller, and Holly Hughes. Thursday night and Friday night, we will have two performances each night featuring all four of the NEA4 artists doing the work they're doing now. They have never performed together. They have never performed in the same theater, let alone on the same evenings. It will be a landmark. I encourage you not to miss it. Karen Finley is actually creating a new piece, especially for the B Word Project. On Wednesday, which is Yom Kippur, Karen will also be at the University Art Museum on campus starting at 7 p.m. doing some meditations and thoughts on some of the art that is on exhibit there right now, especially the works by Lee Krasner, who is a friend of hers. 
that will, she'll be accompanied with a flutist, and that should be a really fascinating evening too. She does those things for the Guggenheim, and she's also doing it for us. So, as you can see, there is a lot going on. We have our own website, bwordproject.org, and I do encourage you to take advantage of these events. Most of them are free. So please exercise your brain and join us. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce one of my colleagues on the B-Word Project, Armando Vasquez Ramos, who is a professor in our Chicano and Latino Studies program here on campus, and who has been teaching a course for the last two semesters funded by the B-Word Project uh, on the murals and art of David Siqueiros, who was censored, and he will be telling you more about our wonderful speaker tonight. So again, thank you for being here. Please come back and, and see us uh, for more B-Word projects and other Carpenter Center shows. Thank you so much, Michelle, and buenas noches. Welcome to all of you that are here. Uh, it is really wonderful that we have been able to uh, pull together this evening's uh, presentation. And I want to also thank uh, Michelle as well as the B Word Project for making possible the, uh, the censorship classes that I have been teaching as well as uh, this magnificent presentation that I can uh, assure you, you will uh, thoroughly enjoy. Uh, I know that we will probably still get a few people to, uh, to come in, but the show must go on. And um, let me uh, say, just uh, uh, make a couple of announcements before I introduce Gregorio. Uh, who I'm sure that many of you are here because you already know about his work and the wonderful presentations that he has been do, uh, making in, in our community as well as literally throughout the world. Um, so again, I want to thank the B-Word Project for making all this possible and for Michelle Roberts who directs this wonderful facility, the Carpenter Performing Arts Center, but also has been leading the, uh, the B-Word Project. Uh, as well as I would like to thank the uh, students in my uh, Chicano Studies 490 class this semester that have been helping me to bring about uh, today's um, uh, presentation, but also that we'll be learning uh, in a uh, service learning experience about censorship in the city of LA's birthplace in La Placita Olvera. Um, uh, we will have a tour from 9 to 12 in La Placita Olvera this Saturday. Anyone that would like to join us, uh, it's a wonderful place to visit and it's a, uh, a, a landmark, unlike any, any other landmark in the city of Los Angeles and I think probably the most important land, landmark in Southern California, the birthplace of Los Angeles being also the location for the uh, reopening of David Alfaro Siqueiros' America Tropical in only a couple of weeks and I invite you to note that on October the 9th, on the 80th anniversary of the unveiling of America Tropical by the Maestro David Alfaro Siqueiros, a new interpretive center of the America Tropical mural will be open on Olvera Street at the Sepulveda House. This is a, 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 a project that has taken literally 40 years to come about. Uh, and with us tonight uh, is uh, dear friend Luis Garza, who is one of the photographers and uh, 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 artistas from LA that worked over the last 40 years since the discovery of this mural, the reappearance of this mural uh, almost 40 years ago, in 1969. Uh, and Luis uh, has um, a, a lot to say about Siqueiros. He will be a part of this project. He directed, curated a major exhibit of Siqueiros in LA last year at the Autry. Uh, and of course, we have many people that are uh, looking forward to all the activities around Siqueiros, which has been the central part of this uh, censorship topic uh, at La Plaza Olvera. But it's not the only topic of censorship that we will cover. So again, I invite you to join us on Saturday from 9 to 12 in this tour. Uh, and I invite you to stay after the presentation to meet and greet uh, uh, Gregorio, if you haven't met him before. Um, definitely, I would also encourage you to consider uh, attending his presentation a week from tonight at La Placita Olvera in the open. Uh, he's blowing up a screen and showing his presentation on, on Siqueiros. 
again, this is all part of the series of activities that are being organized in anticipation of the, um, the, the legacy of Siqueiros in Los Angeles and the influence he had on Chicano murals. So, last but not least, I want to make sure that uh, if you are not on the Gregorius list, that you return those cards that we have been passing around, and also to remind you uh, to consider attending all of those programs that Michelle has already covered that are part of the B-Word project through the end of the year, as well as the Latin American Studies film series that will begin in a couple of weeks. We have passed out a card uh, for you to consider attending any of those dates that you may have available. So, let me, uh, without much more to, uh, uh, to cover, uh, I want to introduce my dear friend uh, Gregorio Luque, uh, who again, for those of you that are uh, from the Long Beach area, needs no introduction, but certainly someone that to me is a, a treasure for the city of Long Beach. Last year, he was um, the, uh, the honor as the Long Beach Artist of the Year. But also, he has been, uh, since he left his position as the founding director of the Museum of Latin American Art here in Long Beach, he has become a worldwide lecturer on various topics from literature to culture and, of course, the arts. Uh, and much of that that he's going to cover today um, is, uh, is brand new material. You are in for a, a real treat. Uh, a brand new presentation that he has prepared, prepared for the B-Word project for us in my class. Uh, but also let me say that he is a distinguished scholar as well as a diplomat. Gregorio uh, uh, served as uh, the Council for Culture here in the Mexican Cultural uh, uh, Council in Los Angeles. And before that he was the uh, first secretary at the Embassy of Mexico in Washington, D.C where he also served as the Deputy Director uh, of the Mexican Cultural Institute. Uh, and needless to say, his, um, his work here in Long Beach as the Founding Director of the, the Museum of Latin American Art was, uh, was phenomenal. Um, he has now lectured in China, in, in various parts of Asia, in, of course, Mexico, where he recently, last year, he did a presentation again like out in the open in front of the National Institute of Bellas Artes, or the Fine Arts, in Mexico City before a crowd of 8,000 people. Two nights in a row he did that. Uh, so he's, uh, and we're really uh, fortunate to have someone like Gregory in our community, someone who I love dearly because of his uh, commitment to the arts and to bringing the arts to the schools, to the children. And I'm sure that he'll have a bit more to say about that uh, let me just say in summary that you're in for a wonderful presentation because Gregorio is dynamic, he's electrifying, and he's quite frankly unforgettable. Please join me in welcoming to the stage to open his presentation, Gregorio Luque, mi hermano. so much. I am uh, really thrilled to be part of this presentation and I want to thank Armando and especially Michelle Robert uh, for her leadership bringing this uh, work that denounces censorship in these days, precisely now, when we see people getting killed because of their ideas, is something that we have to do. And we have to remember that fanatics are not just in the Middle East, they're here as well. And we have to be vigilant to preserve our ability to say and to think and to talk and to criticize. That is an essential part of life. And I would like to, uh, to remember, to dedicate this lecture. I was telling Michelle that I think that this 
it is not a, an accident that out of hundreds of colleges and universities, it was precisely uh, Cal State Long Beach who won this grant. Because there is a tradition of defense of liberty in Long Beach. And uh, I would like to, uh, to make a special mention of Blanche Collins. Blanche Collins was the librarian of Long Beach. She started out uh, as a librarian of children and uh, in 1960 she became the main librarian here. And, and uh, she started uh, to get a lot of problems because uh, somebody found in the Long Beach Library uh, Lolita and uh, accused her of doing uh, pornographic material. Then another person found The Last Temptation of Christ and said that Blanche Collins was uh, supporting blasphemous materials. But when it really got bad is when they started criticizing because you could find in this library books on communism. And so there was a big to do. It was, uh, you know, the height of the Cold War. And uh, they started to attack her in city council and denounce her and say that uh, she should take those books off. And at the time they were building, you know, the new, the new building, and they started saying that they would suspend the funding. And then this lady stood up and said, well, if you take out the funding, it is fine. Because a library is not a building. And then she said, censorship of books urged or practiced by volunteer arbiters of morality or political opinions must be challenged by libraries in maintaining the responsibilities to provide public information and enlightenment through the printed word. She refused demands to remove the books and periodicals on communism. And she, had, and she said, an American should have the right to come into his public library and learn about communism if he wants to. A library should be, she said, the poor man's university. Not just a factual repository, but a place to discover ideas and branch out. Branch out. It is important to have all facets covered. We have enough faith, she said, in the public library system and the deep ideals of democracy for which it stands to know that long after the present radical right-wing groups have disappeared, this library and other libraries throughout the country will serve the basic sense the basic principle that the public has the right to choose. So Blanche, this is for you. I was born in, in Mexico, uh, a country that practices brutal censorship. And I remember you know, that at the time there was this joke about this American and this Mexican. And uh, the, Amer the, the American tells the Mexican, here in the U.S. we have total freedom. We can go right there in the White House and say, down with Obama and nothing happens. And the Mexican says, we can do the same. Says, what do you mean? Yes, we can go right there. The president's mansion, we go right under his balcony. We look him straight in the eye and we say, down with Obama, and nothing happens. <laughs> uh, for many years, there were many words that you could not say, many people that you could not touch. Now things have uh, been apparently eased, but still, uh, Mexico is one of the countries that has more journalists killed every year. And so, this image of Leopoldo Mendes, 
of the great Taller de la Gráfica Popular to me very much symbolizes the horrors and, and the violence of censorship, the limitation to say what you think and to act according to what you believe, the necessity to lie every day and every moment in your life because you are afraid. You are afraid of, of, of being jailed or being tortured or being murdered. This is why it's so important to defend that right, to stand up against any form that limits that freedom and that expression. Censorship is deeply rooted in our society. Uh, the, even though if you read the New Testament back and forth, you will not find a single condemnation of Jesus towards sexuality. On the contrary, what you see in his words is uh, the idea of tolerance, the idea of love, the idea of forgiveness. And yet, something very different has been done on his name. Uh, because what has been the basis of a lot of the actions of the Catholic Church has been, at least in its origin, uh, fortified in the idea of original sin and original damnation. To create a, a profoundly repressive society. Uh, there are three figures in the Catholic Church that are, that are fundamental in this uh, creation of, a, of an institution that spies over people, that coerces every moment of private life, that represses any expression of sexuality or diversity of ideas. St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Jerome, and especially St. Augustine. Now, the interesting thing about St. Augustine is that he, when he was a young man, had a very different life to the one that he preached as a church authority. And we know this because he published his book, his celebrated Confessions, which was, he was a very randy young man. At some point he says, uh, Oh Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. <laughs> And of course, in spite of the, the preachings of St. Augustine, uh, the Church largely exercises and exercised a double morality. Because on the one hand, it pride in people's lives and created a true uh, sex police and conscience police. But on the other hand, the internal scandals of uh, sexuality inside of the church and perversion inside of the church were rampant and well known. Nidas uh, mentioned the Borgias and other atrocities and one of the, the reasons for the schism in the church and the Reformation movement is precisely this double morale, this uh, profound uh, hypocrisy and this differences between what you say and what you do. But the Catholic Church goes way beyond repressing sexuality and created, in my opinion, some of the most unchristian institutions. Uh, and I'm referring, of course, to the Inquisition. Here you see the founder of the Inquisition, Tomás de Torquemada, a man uh, who led the Inquisition, and here you see him with Queen Ferdinand and Isabella. And if you look at paintings like this one of Lucas de Padilla, uh, what the poor victims of the Inquisition have in store is truly horrible. You see people about to be crucified, hanged, tortured in every form or fashion. The Inquisition perfected torture. It created instruments like this one called the rack, in which you tied a person 
and very slowly you dismembered him or her uh, with incredible pain. Those people that survived the wreck uh, lost their bodies, were crippled forever. And among the things that makes the, the wreck so uh, incredibly evil and sadistic is that it gave uh, the torturer the ability to slowly, inch by inch, dosify the pain and the horrors of their punishment. And there are many more. Uh, this is called the heretic chair uh, with uh, apparatus to crush ankles. This chair lined with spikes produced horrible injury. The victims died of, of uh, infection or, or blood loss. Sometimes they heated this so that the nails would be burning hot. And uh, the heretic, the person who defied the dogma of the church, would suffer enormously before he perished. These are just some examples. We could give a seminar of the horrible repression, the horrible censorship practiced for centuries by uh, a church that calls itself the voice of the most generous and beautiful of men. And the role of the Catholic Church in the Inquisition not only persecuted and destroyed uh, innocent people, it also set back the mind of humanity. People like Galileo, uh, who was born in 1564, a physicist, a mathematician, an astronomer. Uh, some consider him the, the father of modern physics and even the father of, of science. And in 1615 he was tried by the Inquisition. And uh, their, their, the, the result of their judgment was that he was vehemently su suspect of heresy. He was forced to recant and to spend the rest of his life in house arrest. The legend is that after he, you know, his crime was to say that the earth moved around the sun and not as the Catholic Church teached, uh, the other way around. Some uh, legend, some say that his, his last words was, and yet it moves. But the terrible thing about the Catholic Church was not only did they condemn Galileo the man, not only did they, did they forbid his books, but they made his ideas heretical. So for hundreds of years, nobody could challenge the stupid dogmas of the Catholic Church. Nobody could say that the earth moves, that the earth uh, circulates. And in this way, science was deeply uh, put back in Catholic countries. In Mexico, uh, we have also a taste of the horrible legacy of the Catholic Church. Uh, Mexico's greatest poet, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, was a nun and was a woman that created beautiful poetry and theatrical pieces and was also a, a brilliant mind. And uh, Sor Juana's great defies in a world of men man's dominance. And when they tell her that how come uh, she thinks and writes that she's a woman, that she's contradicting uh, divine order, so Juana's response is, well, if God really meant us not to be able to read, to think, and to write, why did he give us the ability to do so? In any case, you are the one who is blasphemous. And uh, the end of Sor Juana occurs because she participates in a theological discussion about what is God's greatest gift, what is God's greatest favor. And so Juana's conclusion is that God's greatest gift, God's greatest favor is making us no favors. Because by giving us no favors, he gives us the greatest gift of all, which is free will. God's greatest gift is freedom. They tried Sor Juana, they made her confess, they made her repent. 
And then they made her sign with her own blood, an infamous document called, where she signed, signed her name and said, I, yo la peor de, de todas, yo la peor del mundo. I, the worst of all, I, the worst of the world. So Juana was never able to read or write again. And she spent the last years of her life cleaning floors in her convent. But even in the very heart of the Catholic Church, dissidence occurs. And the great uh, Michelangelo, who paints the Last Judgment, cannot uh, help but poking a, a little bit of fun at, uh, at the Church and its rigid moralities. And here in the Last Judgment, uh, and we know this because these, this mural has been censored and covered over, but uh, Nicolas de la, Ca de la Cosa did some copies of the original murals. So for example, here you have the way that it looks now. You know this image of uh, St. Blaise and St. Catherine. But the way that Michelangelo originally painted was them doing sodomy. As you can see, <laughs> naked and sodomized. And then in another wonderful scene, here you see this covered. But in the original uh, Michelangelo, this man is literally dragged by the balls to hell. And you can see uh, the hand grabbing the man's genitals. And yet, for its ferocity, uh, the Inquisition uh, had some surprising changes of opinion. For example, <coughs> In 1573, it wanted to condemn Paolo Veronese, the author of this uh, Last Supper. And what it accused uh, Veronese was that he presented uh, Jesus with waiters in this lavish dinner, and that could not possibly be the Last Supper. So what Veronese did is he simply changed the title of the painting, and instead of calling it uh, the Last Supper, he called it the Feast in the House of Levy, tax collector. So that made it okay to have waiters and uh, German servants uh, in, in the presentation. But the grip of the Inquisition, hard as it was, began to uh, diminish. And uh, in the early 19th century, there is this fabulous artist, Francisco de Goya, who does uh, a celebrated series called Los Caprichos, in which he puts every, he satirizes society and, and he fantasizes. And he, the Inquisition tries to attack him. However, Goya had powerful friends uh, in government as well, and, and people that were seeing that the Inquisition not only had destroyed scientific thought, but was becoming a problem for the entire Catholic world in terms of economic development. Because while the Protestants were progressing and were innovating and having industries here, all the Catholic world was dark in the, in the, in the dungeons of darkness and dogma. And so uh, Goya had done a series of extraordinary pieces of the clothed and the naked Maha. He made the clothed Maha later, I should have showed you the other way around, but some say that the clothed maha is much more seductive than the naked one. You will be the judge. Huh? <laughs> and uh, the naked maha was collected by Manuel Godoy that was a minister to Charles III. And so, Goya prevails over the Inquisition. And we begin to see that the, the, the limitation or the transition, a little bit like what's happening, you know, in, in those Muslim countries uh, by the tyrannical mullahs, the, 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 the hideous zealots. And this is the way it was also in Catholicism. So it begins to change. And, uh, and Goya is able to criticize the conventions of society, but also this world of witches and superstition. This is a painting he does in 1797 called The Bewitched. 
And notice this person oppressed by all these monsters of censorship and torture. And uh, he even gets away in, in painting the monarchy in their glorious imbecility. You know, look at them. I mean, they're all... <laughs> but he gets away with it because he, he, he puts all these glorious clothings on them. And so they don't realize what he's doing. But look at the faces of them. So, this rigid medieval morality begins to change. There's other examples of cartoons with the etchings and newspapers. Uh, this one by the great... Uh, by the great Daumier. And he was put in prison. He puts uh, uh, this man, this prince, uh, as this fat monster. So he, he's put in jail. But Poiré, Charles Poiré, does something more astute. He finds that the king's face looks like a pear. And so he simplifies it and starts doing little pears here and there. And nobody can criticize him why he's painting a pear, right? So, cartoons find a way to provoke thought and, and criticism. And then you have the, the great lovers like Casanova that writes books about his affairs and his love affairs. He gets censored a bit, but nothing, nothing uh, like uh, François Antoine Donati, and also known as the Marquis de Sade. And uh, also part, as part of the Beat Project some time ago, I saw a play about the Marquis de Sade and how uh, he talks about uh, finding pleasure in pain and all these erotic tales that are considered so obscene that he is uh, imprisoned. And the, the technical piece takes a little bit of license, but it shows you how uh, they end up, uh, he writes so they cut his hands and he speaks so they cut his tongue. No, they, they gradually eliminate all his ability to speak, but even then he still is subversive. There's a whole play on the role of censorship. And in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, the censorship is also very intense. Uh, the Queen Victoria is notorious for this. She has all these ideas on how uh, people should conduct their private lives. For example, the appropriate way of having intercourse was just to stick your penis and do not move until you conclude. In other words, no wiggling at all. And it is said that, uh, you know, at one point, you know, her daughter asks her for advice on her wedding night, and the Queen's response is just, close your eyes and think of England. <laughs> And, and the society they engender is, is one of profound uh, hypocrisy and repression. That you can see it just by looking at the way that people dress. I mean, these kind of waists, of course, are totally artificial. They're done with uh, tightening the body. That is why the women kept on fainting. Uh, and yet, in spite of all their prudishness, uh, the Victorian age is also the golden age of pornography. Pornography, the prostitution of all kinds, everything flourishes in this society. And the tales of the pornographic booklets are, tend to be similar. You know, it's about this prudish, most of them deal with this prudish girl that is taken to a harem. And then when she finds the, the throbing organ, as they describe the penis, she actually likes it. <laughs> and so, uh, in, it is also a society that is that censors and prohibits uh, homosexuals. Uh, the particularly vile with the great Oscar Wilde, uh, author of many books, The Portrait of Dorian Gray and others. And uh, he is condemned and, and, and censored because of a homosexual relationship that he has. And at the end, uh, one of my favorite stories, you know, he's been condemned by the court and the heckler uh, screams at uh, Oscar, he says, you're scum, you're in the mud now, you're worthless, you're, you're in the mud, and uh, supposedly Oscar's response is, sir, we are all in the mud, but some of us are looking at the stars. 
And uh, America, to a large extent, is more Victorian than the Victorians. Remember, here we had the Puritans. So the society in, in, in the U.S. is deeply repressive. And at the beginning of the 20th century, you have people like uh, Anthony Comstock that has all these weird prohibitions. For example, he condemns the immoral use of rubber to make condoms, for example. And there's all this prohibition of, of erotic tales because according to him it encouraged masturbation. And masturbation was something terrible. There were all these ways of how to forbid uh, masturbation. Uh, nowadays Woody Allen says, hey, what? Well, not masturbation, it's sex with someone you love. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in those days, you know, it was like, hey, uh, or this other fantastic one, that he has a very intense sex life, especially when he's by himself. <laughs> but in those days, you know, there was, uh, there was even machines to, to prevent masturbation. Or formulas, like every time that you felt the urge, you had to do the complete Sermon of the Mount, or you had to submerge the penis in cold water. And then tales of, that you went totally blind if you masturbated. There's a famous joke of little Billy, you know, that you know, they tell him, you know, if you keep doing it, he's cut and forgotten. He says, if you keep doing it, you're going you're to go blind. And he says, no, Dad, I figured it all out. I'll stop right when I need glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Other legacies of, of the Comstock era uh, is the redesign of bicycles. Apparently, you know, this was the normal way, the bicycles, but according to the American Puritans, they thought that this would be an orgasm machine for women. This is what they imagined would happen. <laughs> so they removed the bar to this day, no? Because it was just going to pervert women. So you know, girls, please never ride a male bike because perdition awaits you. The Puritanical ideals reached a climax in the Prohibition. <clears throat> After the Roaring Twenties, uh, alcohol was prohibited, and there has never been a time where more alcohol has been consumed, which should give us food for thought. And not only was more alcohol consumed, but also the worst kind of alcohol, alcohol that made people blind, moonshine, things like that, but also the Mafia flourished. So you have uh, uh, massive addiction, consumption of the worst kind, and you have multimillionaire gangsters. It was food for thought for the absurd drug and wars that we're doing for long. Now, one of my goals here was to give you a general view of censorship and not to limit myself only to the present or only to the U.S. And uh, Sadly, some of the worst abuses come in, in communist countries that have been built with the idea of changing society. Uh, and yet, under Stalin, uh, censorship was reached levels uh, unequal anywhere else. Uh, people were put in concentration camps, not because of their race, but because of their ideas. Uh, books were, were forbidden, and then even uh, the great communist leaders were killed. Nobody has killed more communists than the Soviets. Here you see all of Lenin's Politburo, and they were all either executed or imprisoned. Uh, and uh, the main rival of Stalin, the founder of the Red Army, Leon Trotsky, was eventually killed, but before he was killed, the, the censorship made him disappear from history. That is, this is a practice that repeats itself throughout uh, the communist world. Here you see uh, Trotsky, and then in a, in a new sanitized photo, he disappears. So this idea that, that you can disappear people from history. And then, of course, you disappear them physically, as Trotsky, who was murdered in Mexico with this pickaxe. There's also interesting 
cases of censorship of communist artists in the U.S. The most famous are Diego Rivera. Diego Rivera painted in, in the building of Rockefeller Center a mural that had Lenin, the, uh, the founder of the Soviet Union, and so Rockefeller ordered him to take down Lenin. It's a mural that has these kind of these two ellipses. It's everything you can see through the, micros, the, the telescope, and everything you can see through the microscope. All the main industrial devices and all the main agricultural products. And here you see Lenin. And so Rivera was ordered down, uh, and eventually this mural was destroyed by hammering on its surface. I keep telling people that my goal in life, and I'm already buying projectors, is to someday project on Rockefeller Center the censored mural of Diego Rivera. Here in Los Angeles, and this photograph of Siqueiros is by my dear friend uh, Luis Garza, that is with us today. Uh, Siqueiros, another Mexican muralist, uh, vehemently communist as well, created several murals. This is uh, the workers' meeting. But more famously, he did America Tropical, this, this mural in Olvera Street, in El Pueblo. And uh, the commission had been, if you could paint something that would be, you know, tropical, with this idea of exuberant nature and so on. And so he did all that, but then at the end, he asked it to be left alone, and what he painted was this crucified worker under the eagle of imperialism. The mural was almost immediately whitewashed and, and attacked. And yet the figure that had inspired him is real. In other words, Siqueiros had not lied. Uh, eventually, Siqueiros was uh, deported from the country, and in Mexico he would also be uh, imprisoned. But what is interesting is that next week, next Thursday, in Olvera Street, I would like to invite you all, because we're going to do a mural right there, or we're going to put this mural life-size. And this mural that has been censored for 80 years is coming back to life. It's been conserved. It's not what it was, but it's, it's a victory, right? You can clap. <laughs> Another mural that has been censored again and again is Pablo Picasso's Guernica. This is a, a mural that Picasso painted in response to the Nazi bombings in Spain, in the town of Guernica. And uh, it is interesting to observe that when Colin Powell, the Secretary of Defense of the, no, the Secretary of State of the U.S. during uh, George W. Bush, uh, <coughs> declared war on Iraq in the Security Council of the United Nations, there was this mural there. And uh, the U.S. government ordered, I don't know if the U.S. government or Colin Powell, but they blocked the mural. So uh, people would not see it in television. Uh, this is a photograph of Hitler of 1937 in, in Nuremberg. And this is a, a painting of Alfredo Ambrosi of Mussolini. Both cases you see the the individual becoming an all-powerful uh, dictator. And uh, these are also among the most uh, totalitarian, uh, repressive, and uh, prone to censorship regimes in history. And they always begin by burning books. As Heinrich Hein once said, where books are burned, people will follow. And this is exactly what, what happens. Here you see, uh, uh, in 1933, uh, a massive burning of books in Berlin, considered un-German. And uh, Hitler even organized, with the assistance of his Minister of Propaganda, Goebbels, an exhibit that he called Degenerate Art. And in this exhibit, uh, the Nazis put together all the art that they considered degenerate. And, and that they showed it in this 
disorganized chaos as an example of a perversion. It turns out that it is a badge of honor to have been included in that exhibit because among them you have some of the most important contemporary artists like uh, Marc Chagall or uh, Kandinsky or Paul Klee. And as a way to compare the, the bad, degenerate Jewish uh, art uh, that he considered offensive, they organized an exhibit of the good German art with all these you know, heroic figures. But some people were so stupid that they thought that the general art was the good German one because they were all naked. <laughs> now, I don't want you to, uh, to leave you with the idea, oh, thank God, here in the U.S. we're so great, right? Well, here too, we had persecutions and, and, and witch hunts. And uh, here you see uh, Senator uh, McCarthy, who uh, started uh, all this effort to persecute radicals, communists, what he called un-American people. And uh, he did all these meetings where many people, especially actors and directors and screenwriters, and were blacklisted and could work or could no longer work or, could, or had to do it with a pseudonym. Uh, the notorious Edgar J. Hoover also had uh, uh, a deeply uh, repressive idea and he kept files on, on everybody and, and uh, exercised all kinds of pressure and, and, and blackmailing and censorship of people. Uh, this is a, a photograph I, I find very beautiful of 1950 of the Rosenbergs that were accused of being spies and were, were executed. And, uh, you know, before they, they were killed, uh, they, they gave each other this kiss. And, and this, this kiss went all over the world and kind of humanized uh, the, the, the idea. And censorship existed in every aspect of American life. Uh, some took strange forms, for example, kisses were reduced from four seconds to one second and a half. And then you could never show uh, a couple, this is like the uncensored vision, they had to be in separate beds, even if they were married. Then you could never show in an American movie a toilet or the milking of a cow. <laughs> and uh, I hope that we can do this uh, lecture again next year. Please fill the cards that we gave so we can form like a committee and maybe we can, we can try to do this because I would love to do another lecture say on censorship on films and show you all the censored movies. Here is a, perhaps the most censored film called The Andalusian Dog by Luis Buñuel. It begins with this one that they cut this eye and it has all the, the, the desires. It's, it's one of the surrealist masterpieces. But it is a movie so shocking, it was done in 1923, that it is said that they were, Luis Buñuel was showing it to Chaplin, and suddenly they heard a loud sound. It was a projection as it was, had just fainted. <laughs> Buñuel did another, uh, several movies that were very controversial. This one is the, a, the Golden Age. Then there is uh, Ecstasy with the beautiful Haiti Lamar from 1933, considered one of the most erotic movies. And uh, Miss Lamar was not a, just a beautiful woman, she was also an inventor who did elaborate technology. And uh, with Elvis, Elvis the pelvis, in television you had to show him from the waist up, you couldn't show him moving his hips. <laughs> and you had efforts to change these things, you know, the magazines like, like Playboy that uh, had in its first number the beautiful uh, nude of Marilyn Monroe. But what really changed the kind of condemnation and this kind of uh, fixation with repressing and censoring sex was not necessarily uh, the efforts of people like Sigmund Freud, but more statistics like uh, those gathered by Kinsley 
and later Masters and Johnsons, and they made surveys of the American public. And they found shocking things like, for example, 98% of men masturbated. 69% of them had had sex with prostitutes. 33% of the women married and they were not virgins. And even worse, 69% of those who had had sex before marriage did not regret it. <laughs> and so suddenly, everybody that thought that they were in this kind of moral majority, I'm sorry, everybody thought that they were the, the immoral minority, realized that they were the majority. So that begins to, uh, to change. But censorship continues. Movies like uh, Last Tango in Paris of 1973 with Marlon Brando and Maria Schneider. There's an interesting story about it. No? They're making love and all the critics said that Marlon Brando gave it a, a strange spirituality. Because as he was making love to Maria, he lifted his eyes for the heaven as if of seeking for divine approval. And once they asked Marlon Brando, what is it that you lift your eyes to ask the divine approval? He said, no, no, no. The problem is I didn't remember my lines, and so I had written them, so I didn't lift them by us. <laughs> to see if it was... Another uh, particularly potent film is called Night Porter with Charlotte Rampton. And if we do this again next year, I promise to show you all of those scenes. But censorship expresses itself in, in many ways. Uh, the hidden lists, the people that didn't get jobs, the, the secret surveillance of others. And in uh, the, the Dallas Museum, they put together, the director Jerry Bywater, put together an exhibit for the Olympics. And he put together art, like this one by Ben Sean of 1955, the National Pastime, or, or this other one uh, of Joshua Kumiyoshi of skaters. But the exhibit got prohibited because some of these artists had been communist sympathizers. And that was enough to invalidate uh, this exhibit. In the 60s, uh, there is a, a, a wonderful confrontation between the old and the new America. And there is one piece I especially like by Edward Keenholz called The Backseat Dodge done in 1964, and it's like an old little dodge and you have a couple there making love. They showed this at LACMA, at a time where, you know, the old society were condemning the young people because they were accused of being promiscuous. Well, their parents had all been in the dodges, <laughs> making love, <laughs> probably without being married. And so this piece created a stir, it was incredibly controversial. Uh, people talked about suspending the funding for LACMA. Finally, they ended up by closing the door. <laughs> so people just got a glimpse of the two dolls screwing. It was like terrible. They just got a little piece of it. And finally, they opened the door. But the more that they closed the door, they made it restrictive, the more curiosity it generated. There's a fabulous cartoon of Paul Conrad where he says, Oh, it's awful. But when he looks at the Board of Supervisors of LA, it's terrible. <laughs> it's awful. And of course, uh, some of the most pervasive censorship has to do with racial relationships. And uh, the whole hypocrisy of having a society that proclaims itself to be an example of freedom and has a whole class of people that are treated differently because of their race. This photograph I find very eloquent. And you see the, the colored uh, fountains and the, the white. This existed in everything. In the bathrooms, in the hotels, in the baseball teams, in the newspapers. And none of this opinion was ever ventilated. And so the, the killings and the brutality of the black people all suppressed and masked. This image of 1919, this lynching in Omaha, Nebraska, is an image of, of unsurpassed 
human vileness. You see the not only the the lynching of this man, but all the the, the, the satisfaction of of these who had just done the killing. And so in the late 50s, the, the contradiction is exposed. Uh, cases of Rosa Parks that refuses to take the back seat of a bus, or people that, that strikers that parade with the legend, I am a man. And, uh, and yet, uh, all this is met with a great degree of, of repression. This is a, a, another infamous photograph of the sheriff uh, Cecil Ray and uh, Lawrence Raines. They were members of the Klu Klux Klan. And they, they killed three people and were given, were taken off easily. Uh, and you can see their, their satisfaction, their, their sense of, of no remorse at what they have done. So I, I find uh, in the beatings, in the brutality, in the, also a form of censorship, of impeding people to say and to complain and to express their feelings. Uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, who was the world champion and who refused to go to Vietnam. He said, no Vietnamese has called me a nigger. And he was stripped of his title as world champion because of that. Or in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico where Tommy Smith uh, and John Carlos won the gold and bronze medal. Uh, did, uh, while the national anthem was playing, uh, lifted their fists uh, with uh, the Black Power uh, uh, associated with uh, the Black Panther Party. They were immediately sent home. Uh, I met one of them for years. They couldn't find work. They were completely silenced in every form. And uh, in China, the whole social engineering that has to do with Mao's experiments produces some brutal acts of censorship. One of the most notorious is the Cultural Revolution, where young thugs are thrown to attack artists, teachers, and uh, the elders are paraded with and humiliated and sent to do rehabilitating works so that they can achieve communist purity. Here you see some examples of these men and women. Uh, they also destroyed ancient works of art, burned libraries, uh, and in this constant context of, of abuse, uh, you have people like Chen Sihuang, who refuses to confess and to walk around with signs saying that he's a capitalist pig, and in his paintings of traditional Chinese art, like bamboo, or autumn, or two boats, create an art that defies uh, the brutes and the censors. No decade has had, has seen in the 20th century a greatest uh, impetus of, of freedom than uh, the 60s. This is uh, some of the, my favorite slogans. A hand on your cock is more moral and more fun than a finger in the trigger. This, this whole uh, hippie movement that defies materialism, defies uh, the idea, you know, the, the, this is a, a streaker that run naked. Look how beautiful that man is. And, and the profound uh, erotic energy of, uh, of, of, of the 
of the 60s, the, the sexual revolution, the, the change of, of conventions, the liberation of the liberty to love as you wish and who you wish. As I said, the, the increased freedom in sexual expression in art and mass media uh, is a symptom of our victory. And you see it everywhere in, in, in Woodstock, in, in the rock concerts, in the new, in the way people dress and, and people act. It's like a whole reinvigoration of life. And this erotic, uh, artistic, wonderful uh, cry of liberty of denouncing hypocrisy and, and double morales is also translated in the public arena. Uh, and uh, we have the, the, the voice of the young confronting the bayonets of the National Guard in Berkeley or uh, expressing their feelings in the, in the streets. And it's a world phenomenon. In Saigon, you have the, the Buddhists burning themselves in defiance of the corrupt government. And all throughout the U.S., uh, those things that cannot be said, that are stopped in the media, that are not published, that are not spoken in the radio, are said in the streets uh, with voices and, and with signs. Uh, and, and, and with the vivid participation. Few artists have embraced uh, this spirit of, of, of diversity and energy with greater purity than John Lennon. I was uh, hearing again his songs of the, uh, of the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, and uh, this is like his, the censored photo of uh, John and, and Yoko know the two. He had gotten in trouble before as a Beatle, once he declared that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. But now he took on the war movement and, uh, and he used his vast uh, popularity and, and wealth to, to fight these demons. He put these huge billboards, all, uh, you know, uh, saying war is over. And he did albums and and songs about it. And uh, the, the, the cry of, of the young is heard all over the world. Also in, in France and in Czechoslovakia, where the young people put flowers in the Russians' uh, rifles. In few places, the youth movement is met with more brutality than in Mexico. In 1968, for the first time, uh, the Mexican youth and society comes out to protest. But here they are met with the brutal army that, and the, the government unleashes the tanks on the young. Hundreds are murdered the 2nd of October of 1968, and many more are placed in jail. The newspapers are censored, their voices uh, silenced. And to some extent, this happens throughout Latin America. This is why when the U.S. claims some moral superiority over the communists or the Russians, I, I question it. Because in Latin America, we know all the, the tyrants supported by the U.S. that flourished all over Latin America. In Paraguay with Stresner, in Argentina with Videla, in Brazil, in Chile with uh, Pinochet, who stormed uh, La Moneda, the palace, and then jailed and tortured people with truly medieval tactics, uh, censoring every form of liberty, uh, introducing uh, the most horrible and despicable forms of torture, like using electroshocks or introducing rats in, in women's vaginas or torturing uh, children in front of their parents. <laughs> Uh, and again, even the most 
repressive regimes. Can you imagine a place like Argentina, uh, a, a corrupt and vile military supported by the wealthy, supported by the U.S. A totally censored and silent society. And it is these young people, or old people, in the case of Argentina, the, the fall of the dictators was done by the women, by the mothers and the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo that defied the torturers and came out with their signs demanding where are their children and their grandchildren. So wherever uh, there is oppression and there is silence and there is censorship, the, 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 they must be challenged. In the U.S., another important struggle has been to legitimize and to give social equality to, to gays and to lesbians. One of my favorite artists, uh, Robert Maplethorpe, extraordinary photographer in his own right. I mean, last year I was in, in Florence. And they were showing some of Maplethorpe's images right next to the David of Michelangelo. Beautiful and pure. And, uh, and yet, Maplethorpe could have made a career simply, I mean, the most beautiful flowers, the most beautiful portraits. And yet, Maplethorpe has the courage to photograph exactly the things that irritated society. And he does these images of uh, gay life, and he takes not just the, 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 the nice, accepted uh, gay life, but also the, the controversial, the, the prohibited. Images like, like this one, no? the, the man in, in polyester suit, tremendously uh, controversial. And so there was this, uh, or, or this, Portrait of Louis Bourgeois with this it looks like a gigantic penis. And her her expression, and the smile makes the photograph. <laughs> and so this exhibit of all his work was going to be shown in seven cities, among them in DC. And uh, some of the images were, were censored. And so the activists went at night and projected on the walls of the Corcoran all the images that had been forbidden. For me personally, this is a, a very important moment in my life because that's where I got the idea of doing murals under the stars. <laughs> I saw that and I said, hey. <laughs> now uh, I'm putting all my savings next Thursday because I'm going to buy an inflatable screen <laughs> so I can go to the parks and to the gyms. So California, here I come. <laughs> Don't miss it, huh? it's free. It's, that, it's next Thursday at 7 in Olvera Street. And I'm going to unfold my inflatable screen, my projector. We're talking about cicadas. So, uh, and at the same time that this is happening in the West, the communist barriers are collapsing. The breaking of the, the Berlin Wall, the, the falling uh, the, the rise of the workers in, in Poland, the solidarity movement led by Lech Walesa. But new forms of censorship arise. This is a, an interesting photograph because it shows you uh, uh, what they called in those days a heroic muhedin. This idea of the armed fanatic, Muslim fanatic, is an invention of the CIA. Not that there weren't fanatics before, but taking fanatics and giving them weapons was something that was done in Afghanistan to fight the Russians. Trained them to use Scud missiles, armed them to the teeth. They even imported uh, the, a, a blind Egyptian cleric, Sheikh Omar, to Afghanistan so that he would rev up these uh, Frankensteins that we create, and that now, of course, are all over the place. This is not in any way to excuse the horrors of the fundamentalists of whatever religion. 
And uh, here you have uh, the Taliban blowing up the ancient Buddhas in 2001. They had been built in the 4th century. And this <coughs> ideological cells, the same people that are burning embassies and, and, and killing uh, diplomats, and, and, and threatening people's liberty. These same thugs took an ancient Buddha and bombed it and destroyed it, as you can see in this photograph. No, they have no excuse. And they should be condemned again and again. And we should not be afraid of condemning the Celts. Here is another vile group, the North Koreans, that have made gods out of ridiculous mortals, the dear leader and the senior leader, and now threaten us with nuclear weapons. And here, this photograph to me tells me all I need to know about that society. This one also. Here you see uh, this famous 1989 photograph of right, right when the Chinese <coughs> went into Tiananmen and murdered <coughs> scores of innocent students. And here you see this young man standing in front of a column of tanks. So the fight of censorship takes many ways. It takes the denouncement of fanatics and religious zealots wherever they may be. It takes the confrontation of uh, oppressive regimes but also, like uh, Jeff Koons did in his wonderful 1991 series, Made in Heaven. He did it with La Chicolina. And uh, it is a, a celebration of eroticism, where he actually performs all kinds of glorious sex with her. Another art that is deeply censored, and that happens right in front of our, of our noses, is street art. There is uh, something wonderful about street art. This is a, a photograph of Barry McGee in San Francisco of 1993. And street art is not just painting. It is also, as this image of the Colossus of Rhodes shows, it's also poetry. There are messages and voices. Here is uh, this uh, John Fetner, Broken Promises of 1980. Countless of people have gone to this place to do speeches about the ruin of uh, uh, urban societies. And here in this abandoned building, with these primitive uh, elements, this white and this text, makes a more powerful artistic statement than what happens in, in many museums or, or many galleries. Mr. Krebs, Joey Krebs, says this very well. He says, these are the thoughts that set fire to your city. <laughs> Some of them, like this one uh, in, in Italy, are truly fantastic from, from a visual point of view. Or, or this other one in, in Brazil that has all these eyes. You have it better, you see it here better in the mountains. <coughs> the, the attempt to convert the entire landscape into a canvas. Or others are simply.